Well, uh, my name is Matt Huber, and I am a nerd. Um, I have a thing for algae, and um, I am uh, pretty resolved that algae is going to be one of the tools that we use to actually save the world from climate change. So kind of my job right now is to get that information out to you guys. And um, here's kind of the way that we're going to do it today. Here we go. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking first about algae beads and brainy brinies. Um, uh, first, we're going to actually do an algae bead experiment. We're actually going to do a little project with algae beads today um, that you guys can repeat with your students. Um, Next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm maybe the world's worst businessman by going into a little bit of history on why I created Algae Research and Supply. And um, next, we'll go into uh, what we call the, the Brainy Briny Project. And this is one that I really, really love because it makes algae kind of sexy. We, we found some ways to grow and quantify microalgae so that we can actually track its growth using SI units, right? And be able to do it super easy so your students can have a long-term data set that they own. Um, and then next, we'll feed that algae to brine shrimp. And the brine shrimp biomass will go up, and we can quantify that brine shrimp biomass, again, using SI units. Um, and that is also really, really cool. So um, with those two things, we can actually do the transfer of matter and energy from a plant to an animal, and it's totally simple. So. Um, and then finally, at the end of the project, we'll, or the end of the period, we'll come back to the experiment and break it down so that we can see uh, if it worked or not um, using the algae beads. So, so first question, have you guys, um, have you ever had uh, that stuff called bubble tea? Have you ever had bubble tea? Yeah, my daughter's crazy about it right now. We've got this place called Froglanders here in Carlsbad that is just absolutely crazy. It's really ridiculously priced, but it's got like 30 grams of sugar per bead and it's crazy. But it's those little beads are very similar to what we make algae beads from. That's actually the same material. It's sodium alginate. It's not bubble tea, which is like, or not, not boba tea, which is usually tapioca. Although some people make boba tea out of sodium alginate. Um, what we do is we use that same material, which is an algae project called a product called so or called sodium alginate, and we spin down some microalgae in a centrifuge, and then we concentrate it, mix it with sodium alginate, and then we drip it into a calcium chloride water bath. You guys might have done this to make um, uh, uh, little uh, um, what are they called yeast balls, maybe for some of your other projects, or if you've been to a fancy schmancy restaurant, it's the very same thing that they put onto little um, vinegar pearls that might go on a salad. Um, anyway, what we've done is we've made them into model organisms. And no, no stiletto heels on these model organisms. They just are model organisms, meaning that they are fairly uniform in their, their manufacture and their makeup. So we have, we can put them into little beads or little uh, snap cap centrifuge vials here. And um, we can use them to actually demonstrate biological processes. So what we're doing here and why they're different colors is that these are in a pH indicator solution. It's called a carbonate indicator. It's got bromothiol blue and creosol red in it, right? So it's really simple. Um, and you guys have used those chemicals probably in your chem labs, uh, maybe when you were in school, um, but your chemistry teachers definitely use them to demonstrate color change. So what happens when these algae go through photosynthesis they consume CO2 and they make new sugars and new biomass from that carbon dioxide. So what we've done is we've taken that process um, and turned it into something that's gonna react very uh, visually stimulating for your students. Why does it change pH? Because CO2 in water forms carbonic acid. You guys remember the whole ocean acidification problem that we're having in the world right now? That's because CO2 from the atmosphere is going into the surface layer of the ocean and causing that pH to drop, becoming more acidic. Um, and it does that by forming carbonic acid. So that's exactly what we see here. When we see photosynthesis though, that, see that carbonic acid gets removed and the pH goes up. And then when respiration occurs, the pH comes right back down. So what we can see with these algae beads, very quickly within usually 15 to 35 minutes, we can see a good color change going up or down. Um, actually going up is the fast one. Going down usually takes at least overnight, sometimes up to 48 hours, depending on how far along, how purple this, this turned. 
So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna test that we're gonna test these little algae beads out, and you guys can play with some of those that we have in your your beaker bags there that we sent you. Um, and uh, we're gonna do a quick little experiment. So the experiment we're gonna do today was one that uh, I, I read this rumor on the internet. Maybe you guys have seen these rumors as well. Um, they're saying that photosynthesis is an enzyme-driven, um, light-dependent reaction. Have you heard that craziness? I don't know if it's true or not. It's kind of ridiculous, right? So if it is an enzyme, that means it's a protein, right? Proteins we know a little bit about. We know that at low temperatures, proteins operate more slowly than at high temperatures. They move more quickly. Michaelis met in kind of kinetic stuff. So we remember a little bit of that. And then, and then if we heat them up too, too much, as in any protein right now in, in Arizona, um, they break down, right? They, they, um, uh, they denature. So we can test that. And then light and dark, that's pretty easy. We can put something in the light and dark. So I'm gonna take you over here and we're going to actually go through a little thing here. So I have, the reason I was playing with my little thermometer there, I have an ice bath here that's at 1.8 degrees C. I've got another one that's at room temperature here. We are at 22 degrees, 21.7 really. And then this one here is at 57 degrees. That's pretty warm. Um, and then this is what your lab bench might look like on a day before or the day after you're doing some experiments. You'll have a whole bunch of these algae beads. Um, I like to separate them by pH. So I, I try to pull the ones that are still purple over here. I'll put those in my desk drawer or whatever overnight. I'll take some of these. Um, I'd be suspicious of the ones that are super yellow like that because those might be dead, um, as you would assume that the in, in the 57 degree one will kill them. So I'm suspicious of those. These I'll probably be able to use next, but prior to your arrival today, I already got a few of these already made down. So these are all identically colored. So the color that they're going to see here is all what we call on the on the. Uh, on the color spectrum. So they're not pegged down at the yellow because if they're pegged at the yellow, this yellow could be, it could be right there at the 7.6, but it could also be all the way down at six. So I don't like to use them if they're super yellow. I like to use them when they're just on scale, right? And then the same as the purple side over here, which is why I want to put those into some dark for a little while. Cool, all right, so let's start a quick little experiment. Experimente. So here we go. I'm going to put two of these into this ice bath here. I'm just going to make sure that they get a little icy, icy on them real quick. And I'm going to make sure that they're floating horizontally. There we go. Next, I'm going to take two more of them and I'm going to put them on the room temperature one, just like that. And then I'm going to put two more of them on the, in the hot water as well. And we've got a special treat for you guys today. So I have a buddy that just went overseas and he came back with some special stuff for me. You guys can probably, you probably already have some in your lab. Um, this is, um, uh, this you guys can use like um, probably just standard aluminum foil, but this is actually brought back from Europe, from England. This is aluminum foil. It's a little bit more expensive, but, but I like to use that because it's just kind of cool. So I've got that there and I'm gonna actually set this up so that it's a little tiny bit higher. This is just a prop. There we are. And then I am going to take this. This is a, we call these, we make these. This is what we call a bench top light. It's just a, a piece of acrylic with some uh, LED strip lights inside of it um, that allows us to do experiments like this where we can actually see what's going on underneath there. So, um, Right now we've got, what time is it over there? Uh, it is quarter after. We're gonna be able to see some really cool results pretty quickly here. I'm gonna keep my eye on it. Cool, all right. So this is a, um, a lab experiment. I really like this one because I'm a visual learner. I learn stuff by watching it, right? Like most scientists, you, you guys probably had your own little adventures when you were kids staring at something. For me, it was, I got a fish tank and I just stared at it forever. I got taught to go fly fishing by my grandpa. And then like after that, all I did when we were up at the river was just look in the water and see all of the insect larva on the bottom or look at the fish swimming. And like those observations that I made really set me forward in my life becoming a scientist to doing observational research. And that's really what I've done my entire adult life, um, been working at all sorts of different labs. Um, but for this stuff, I like this because you can see this color change. It happens fast. 
These are pretty inexpensive. So you can get um, a set of like 10 of them uh, or you can get a set of 100 of them for like an entire set of classrooms, right? And then give, it, give them to your students in groups of 10, right? Uh, so your student groups can go break those up into a treatment and control or they can put them a distance from the light. It's great for student driven inquiry where they're going to do the study to find out how fast the color change happens, which one happens faster or slower. Um, it's just really great because it's very, very visual. And that's, that's, a, that's a big thing for me. I like the visual nature of that. Oh, and one last thing on this, we've got um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, lesson plans and handouts and um, all the stuff you'd need um, to actually like do a whole module just on the algae bee. It's definitely worthwhile pulling, pulling down from our internet uh, uh, site on that because it's, and it's all free. Um, so you guys can play with that. If you like the algae beads, it'll give you some really great ideas to do more stuff. Cool. All right. So why am I here? Um, it's a good question. So to do that, we've got to kind of go back in time. The year is 1998 and I'm living in Irvine. Actually, I'm living in Newport Beach on Balboa Peninsula, if you guys know where that is. I surfed every day. Um, I was a total uh, surfer dude, lots more hair back then. Um, and then I worked at Allergan doing toxicology. Um, as well as over at another company that got bought by Purdue Pharma. Yes, that Purdue Pharma called Cosensus. And I was uh, at that place, I was a behavioral pharmacologist um, where I would give animals different drugs and then teach them to push buttons. If they felt stoned on one drug, they'd push this button. If they felt high on another drug, they'd push this button. And then we'd try to make those effects go away. So they'd be like, dude, I don't feel anything, right? Um, but it was at that place that I met my first mentor. Uh, his name was Dr. Richard Carter, and he was an amazing human being. Um, I really liked him. He uh, came to me one day and he said, Matt, thank you so much for, for being in our lab. You're a big help for us. But I really got to be honest with you. I don't think you're supposed to be in pharmaceuticals. I think there's another science for you that's out there. Not that we want to get rid of you, although I did think about that a little bit. Not that I want to get rid of you, but I think you need to go find out what it is. So, Matt, I want you to go to the desert. And I don't want you to come out until you know what you want to do with your life. And I was like, what? Dr. Carter, you want me to go to the desert? Well, you do what your boss says, right? Every single time. So I went out to the desert, went to the eastern side of Joshua Tree National Park. And I was there for two nights before I kind of figured out three things. One was that um, Schoolhouse Rock video. Do you guys remember the one about energy? Don't make me sing it. Come on. Energy. We're gonna use it all up. The fires got higher and higher and carbon did something and some, I don't remember all the words, but that one just kept coming back to me. Um, why? Because I knew that CO2 levels, this is even back, back in 80 or in 98, I knew that CO2 levels were really getting out of control and that they were doing nothing but going up, right? I knew that was an issue. Um, so Schoolhouse Rock, CO2 going up, and I knew I really liked um, oceanography. I liked to be out in the water. I knew something with water was what I was supposed to do. And then I reflected on um, a fact that I learned in undergrad, which was that microalgae were responsible for more than half of the world's photosynthesis, meaning more than half the world's carbon dioxide fixation. So I was like, okay, you know, I think, I think I'm going to go save the world. So I thought, okay, yeah, you know, maybe a little megalomania. Who doesn't have a little megalomania when they're out in the desert, you know, drinking nothing but water for several days, right? Um, so there I was. I was like, okay, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to, uh, I'm going to go to graduate school. So I got into a biological oceanography program just to the east of you guys there off in uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs, which is in the Monterey Bay. Um, so I'm sorry, west and down um, from where you guys are out there. Um, and uh, it was there that uh, they've got a very fast, accelerated five-year master's program. Um, it's very quick. There's no abuse of graduate students whatsoever there. But while I was there, I did just what I, I set out to do. I looked at photosynthetic rates um, of microalgae as you change carbon dioxide concentrations. And I found out something very, very kind of obscure that four people that was super awesome for about four minutes and then they were done that was it so it was exciting it was kind of fun but while i was there for that brief five-year period um not only did i teach at a community college hartnell college if you guys have ever heard of that place down there but i also got really really good at growing microalgae that was my job at the school 
was I took care of the microalgae collection. And we gave the microalgae cultures to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and then UC Santa Cruz, which was great. I, I really enjoyed it. But finally, um, my tour with the, being a starving grad student had to expire. And I wandered around a little bit and then found myself down here in Southern California on the Eastern side of this little mountain range right here in San Diego in a place called the Imperial Valley. You guys ever heard of the Imperial Valley? The Salton Sea is down there. Right now they're like 120 degrees Fahrenheit outside. It's a super, super, um, uh, super, super hot place to be right now. And it's, it's hot, they get monsoons. So it's sweaty, right? And it's really humid. And the Salton Sea is evaporating after having a bunch of eutrophic water from farm runoff going there. So there's a lot of like algae that's died and it stinks, right? So it's hot, it's sweaty, it's stinky. It's really the perianal area of California, right? However, it's a really great place though to grow microalgae. And that's where I met my second mentor. Um, my second mentor's name is Amha Balai. And he is the uh, chief technology officer at Earthrise Nutritionals which grows spirulina. You guys ever had spirulina? Yep, if you, you had, yep, that's like that superfood green stuff. I had something to do with what you did. It was great, I, got, I was down there, I was working with Amha for about three years um, and we did some amazing, super fun things. I learned so much from him because he had 48 acres of outdoor ponds exposed to the sun, growing super fast in ponds that are about this deep, right? paddle wheels moving the water around. Um, one of the big problems that I helped uh, to solve with AMHA was we looked at doing what we call mass transfer of CO2 into the ponds. Why do you need CO2 in the ponds? Because that algae grows so fast that the, the rate of diffusion from the gas into the water uh, isn't fast enough to go from the atmosphere into the pond. So we actually have to pump in CO2 into the water. Right. So I helped Amha come up with some new technology, which was very fun. I get to play engineer and I love being a scientist engineer. It's one of my favorite hobbies. Um, so uh, we came up with a way that saved them 90 percent of their CO2 budget, which was about a million dollars a year. And Amha shared 10 percent of that with me as a, as a bonus for getting that job done. He didn't share a penny with me, but that was OK. Amha is a good guy. Um, but uh, finally, the day came when I said, Amha, hey, buddy, I, I met a girl and I got I to gotta leave town. So Amha said to me, he says, Mata, because he's, he's from Ethiopia, yay tall, deep, gravelly, just a, a beautiful voice. He, he probably smoked or he did smoke too much in his 20s. So he says to me, Mata, you are going to move to San Diego to be with that girl. Good, good. You are going to get a job growing algae for biofuels and I will help you get that job. So we were really excited. I was really excited because I ended up working with a giant corporation down here in Southern California that's a government contractor. And um, we built uh, farms to grow microalgae. I built one in La Jolla, one across the street from Amha in the Imperial Valley. I built another one out in Pecos, Texas, and then another one out in Hawaii. And we made a bunch of jet fuel uh, for the US military. We made JP8 out of algae. And I was so freaking stoked because that guy I promised that I would do uh, the good stuff for back in uh, the Imperial, or when I took my little time out in Joshua Tree, uh, saying I'm gonna save the world with algae, I was actually doing it. It made me so super happy that I was going to, to save the world, right? Come on, like everybody's dream comes true. And then the government turned off the funding for the, the algae stuff. The, um, the, the powers that be that pull oil up out of the ground said, okay, we'll just put more oil into the market. The oil prices came down to $30 a barrel from $200 a barrel. And then at the same time, those same oil companies bought up all the intellectual property for making algae oil and put that in their pockets. So I was so super bummed, right? Because there I was, I was at the top of my game and now I'm crying drinking a beer in my garage because that's where I had my laboratory. I, I was, I had that time I had left the, um, the big government company, government contracts, and I put all my stuff in the garage. I had a lab that I was set up to do and I had cultures growing in there and I'd be in there just drinking and staring at the cultures thinking, what am I going to do now? And my wife comes to me and she says to me, Matt, why don't you, 
why don't you just put some algae cultures on the internet, try to sell them on Amazon or something, right? And so I did just that. So we got these little cute tissue culture flasks, which everybody thinks are just totally sciencey. And I made a little algae culture kit, put it on Amazon. And in the first year, $300 of algae cultures got sold. And I was stoked. That was $300 that didn't exist before. And people were buying it. People, like, people were buying it. I was like super excited. So then um, I said, okay, well, this is great. So I doubled and tripled down, put more time and effort into getting the stuff out there, taking some cool pictures and stuff, putting it on. And I set my own website up. And finally, because I had my own website, I could actually get data collected. And by the time I had a chance to look at this data set, because scientists, scientists love data sets. By the time I looked at that data set, I realized who was buying the algae cultures. And you know who it was? You know who it was. It was you guys. It was the teachers. It was the science teachers. Um, believe it or not, middle school science loves algae. And so does AP Bio, which is why I'm here right now. AP Bio and AP Environmental Science. You guys we're, we're buying the culture. So I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I, I finally have a market. I, my family may not starve. But then the bigger, uh, uh, the bigger light bulb went off. And this is one that I had to take a giant slice of humble pie. It's probably not going to be me that saves the world. More likely, it's going to be you guys. And even more likely than that, it's going to be your students that are gonna be the ones that are gonna come up with the really amazing ideas that are gonna bring down the CO2 concentrations in the, um, in the atmosphere so that we can survive on this planet a little longer. So I really had to, to change myself from being the hero to being the tool. So now I fully completely embrace the fact that I am a tool. I am a conduit to teach you guys um, how to grow algae and to give uh, the materials and supplies and the know-how to you so that you can inspire your students into thinking that algae is actually pretty neat. So that's my goal. That's what I'm doing right now with, with my company and my life here. Um, and here's why I'm the world's worst businessman. Yes, we like money. Um, so if you've got a lot of budget, yeah, we'll totally take it. But if you guys don't have a huge budget or you don't have any budget at all to buy supplies, we will help you out. We have turned away zero people. Um, for who need and want to use algae. So um, don't let money be the reason that you don't grow algae. If you want it, we'll give it to you for free or at whatever, if you can help us with the shipping, anything you got, we'll help you to get it to your classroom. We don't want money be to be the reason you don't do this. Um, so please tell your friends about us. We're, we're there for you. So, but we did have a challenge, right? So I think algae culture is super exciting, right? You guys probably do too, right? At least you'll tell me that right now. Um, but I, well, while well, I think that this color, let me get this one because this one's even prettier right now. Well, I think this color here is just fantastic and it makes me super, super happy. It's not very exciting for kids to just say, okay, great. I grew some green stuff, right? I have this in my swimming pool, right? Um, so we had to make it really, really exciting. So, um, I had to go back to my grad school days again to come up with an idea to really make this neat. And I reflected on, um, my housemates. So where I was growing the cold, prickly microflora, my housemates were, um, they were Stanford graduates. You know that um, right next to the aquarium is the Hopkins Marine uh, Institute. It's Stanford's Marine Science Center. So my housemates were all PhD students out there. And they set out, they made the technology that goes with, for the satellite pop-up tags for, for tuna. Have you guys seen the, 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 um, the Discovery Channel videos where they put these things in tuna and sharks, like, and the great white shark was caught and released up in the Farallons and it traveled all the way to Hawaii. Um, that was my housemates, right? So literally these guys have their own freaking uh, Discovery Channel shows on TV while we're in school, which really like, I'm, I'm like struggling trying to do research on algae. Well, there are literally, we get mail with covers of, with, they're on the cover of fishing magazines where they're like, okay, South Carolina fishermen. Hey, there's Andre. Andre Bustani, he now works for the aquarium as well. He's their head um, fisheries guy. Um, so he did all that technology. It was great. But he studied the warm, cuddly megafauna and got TV shows. It's interesting. I studied the cold, prickly microflora and didn't get any TV shows. So what I had to figure out how to do was how to make algae exciting. And I reflected on bringing in animals. So this is what we did. You guys remember the 70s and the um, sea monkeys. Thank you. 
goodness, you'd figure I'd remember that. But so these are like the sea monkeys. These are brine shrimp. You can see them swimming around in there. That's a male right there with the, she's got, or he's got the big clasp around his front. The males and females are what we call sexually dimorphic. The males have a clasper and the females have that brood sac. So you can tell them apart right away. Um, they are cruising around in there. Uh-oh, see what's going on there? There were two grabbing onto each other. Nope, not in that one maybe. Um, they will actively hold on to each other and exchange genetic information right there in your classroom. And they usually hold on. Is that the pair right there? I'm looking on the screen as we look through here. Is that a pair of them up there swimming around in a circle? No, maybe not. But they will grab onto each other and hold on for about two days, right? While they while they exchange genetic information. So this is a really cool thing for your very mature um, uh, high schoolers to have in the classroom, so that they will um, absolutely not just giggle about and, and talk about. But this is a great thing because you can now start talking about the um, about reproduction, about grazers, um, because the algae will grow, and we can quantify that, and then we can feed it to the brine shrimp. So. This is a really neat kit. No, that isn't good. There's nobody in there getting it on. That's pretty amazing. Usually there's always somebody in there doing it. That's okay. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna show you how to set up this kit and then um, quantify everything with it. And then we'll give you the answers as to what everything should actually weigh too. So it's really easy. So let's start off um, by knowing that this is an ecosystem. This is an entire ecosystem. This can actually live on your shelf in your lab for years. Um, uh, Kelsey, you know, uh, um, Jenny Edgar, she's had hers on her shelf for over two years now. And then we've got a guy up in Seattle who's uh, not a teacher, but he's a research scientist and he thinks these are great. So it's been on his shelf for four years, um, just sitting there growing, dying, reproducing, and just staying there closed. And he actually puts a little water in it every once in a while, but it's a neat little ecosystem. So let's set one up with you. Um, with every ecosystem, there are the physical, chemical, and biological properties. We're going to start with this. This is a beaker bag. Um, this is the physical boundary of your, um, your ecosystem. Um, the beaker bags used to look like this, right? These are tissue culture flasks, similar to the little cute ones we had. But these break. If you give this to a high schooler, chances in within the first 20 minutes, he or she is going to drop it and it's going to shatter because it's poly... Um, uh, polystyrene, it's very flat, or it's very crackable. Um, those sucked. We couldn't figure out how to make it work. So I had a Zoom meeting with some people up in Tacoma, Washington. And one of the women on the Zoom call where we were, we were talking about how to, how to make it work, she says, hold on a second, I got to breastfeed my baby. She turns the camera off. And then as soon as she does that, everybody else who's a parent in the room, we were like, oh, breast milk bags, that's what we got to use. So this idea for this bag came about from breast milk bags. Just like breast milk bags, there's graduations here to show how much volume we've got that we've made. Unlike breast milk bags, however, we have this millimeter grid here. Um, so you can measure things in the water, such as brine shrimp or other stuff that you have in the water. Um, so there's that. So what we do to get this started is slide it open. You don't need to tear the top off, just slide it open and then stick your finger in there. I like that top part there so that we can keep the, we have a place to put the names. Then you're going to open this up, put it over your face, and pop that open. Cool. Awesome. Um, and if you're traveling with young children, make sure you put yours on first before you do theirs. Airplane humor. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, great. So that's there. Um, it's open. This is now the boundary for your ecosystem. Uh-oh. Hey, Danielle, can you chuck me a salt and a cyst? Sorry. Um, so while she is bringing me that stuff, I'm going to show you guys this really quick because this is pretty funny um, and actually pretty awesome too. Can you see inside here? Some of these brine shrimp have what appears to be very, very long tails. Do I actually have some in there that have a really long tail? Oh, there's one right over here. This guy. That's actually not a tail. It's poop. And you'll see it inside here. It's green because it's, it's got all the algae, the dead algae in it that they've eaten. And it trails behind them up to like 10 times their body length, which is pretty funny. So um, knock, knock. Brine shrimp. You're welcome. 
Um, my, my friend who is the Lorax for the Great Salt Lake, her daughter made that joke up. And <laughs> she's actually the one, I don't know if you know this or not, but Utah just got the brine shrimp to be the state's official crustacean. Just voted in in February this year. And she's the one who helped out to get that happening. And these brine shrimp salts that you see here, these are actually made to emulate the Great Salt Lake. So I'll pour those right down inside there. This is gonna bring your salt concentration, which is another physical characteristic, to 40 grams per liter, okay? Uh, we're gonna add some chlorine-free water now to it. Um, reverse osmosis, DI, filtered, uh, free of chlorine, uh, anything free of chlorine, and you're gonna be just fine. Um, I like to fill this up to about 450 milliliters. That makes the, um, it gives you a little bit of space up at the top for when you close for an air bubble. Um, I like to do that for a number of different reasons, but mainly because it helps out. Um, oh, it's truly funny. Uh, this is technically beer bong technology. You guys remember you got to pass the little silver bullet through the beer bong to get the foam out, but having the, having the bubble inside here, um, sorry, you know, I was, I was in college. Um, having the bubble go back and forth helps to mix up those, um, uh, the, the salts that are inside there. The salts don't need to dissolve right away. It might take, you know, several hours or maybe even overnight before everything dissolves. So this is the physical uh, environment now. Um, and as you guys are getting there, we'll get the next step in because the next step is pretty simple too. Um, the next step is just to add in the chemical part. And that's where this comes in. For those of you who have the farming persuasion or gardening history. This is an NPK of 1011. So we're looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, plus trace elements and micronutrients and milk and juice to make it complete. Um, just kidding. Watch too many breakfast cereal commercials as a kid. Um, so this is going to go bloop, right in there as well. So these are the nutrients. Just add those right into your beaker bag as well. Don't have to worry about it if the salt doesn't completely dissolve. It'll dissolve by tomorrow. And your brine shrimp and algae are going to be just fine with that. Once you get the uh, micronutrients, uh, the nutrients in there, go ahead and pull up this next part here. This is the algae. This is one of my favorite friends here. This is this algae is called nanochloropsis. And at the bottom of your, your, your the, the centrifuge tube there, you see at the pellet side, you see some detritus down there at the bottom of it? A little bit of junk in there, um, maybe at the bottom of it. Mine doesn't have it because we just poured this neat from another container this morning. Um, there should be a little bit of chunkies in there. That's important. That's the bacteria and fungus that's gonna help you guys decompose the um, brine shrimp poop, um, as well as dead brine shrimp and dead algae so that the, all, all of those things will decompose, releasing the nutrients again to feed the microalgae. And then the algae will go through as a primary producer and feed the brine shrimp again, making Simba and the circle of life complete. So go ahead and take the algae now and you can dump the entire contents of it right into that beaker bag. And then you can close it down, shake it up a little bit more. There is, um, disagreement in the algae and the brainy briny community, whether you want to leave these open or closed. I like to leave them closed for the first few weeks you use them with your students, just because students are going to tip them over. Um, but other than that, they can go open or closed. We, I haven't seen convincing evidence either direction. Um, but if they're open, they're an open system. Gases are going to be able to go in and out. If they're closed, it's a closed system. So um, if you have a lot of brine shrimp in there at night when there's no oxygen being produced, they could go eutrophic. So just keep that in mind. And that's another kind of variable that you guys can think about too as you go through. So this is ready to grow. And you're thinking to yourselves right now, that's pretty cool, Matt, but where do I put it? Good question. Okay, where do we put it? I personally am a huge fan. I'm not really a fan, I'm a human but I'm a fan of these um, uh, shop lights uh, that you can get from the big box hardware stores. They're neat, they're the LED ones. So they actually, um, uh, you can actually put your beaker bag touching them, actually physically touching them and they'll get a little bit warmer. 
Why do you need them a little bit warm? Um, well, the brine shrimp won't reproduce unless they're at about seven, up in the upper 70s, low 80s. So they need to stay a little bit warmer in there because if it's got it getting hot in there, then they'll take off all their exoskeletons and they'll go through, that was, that was a, another one there. It's getting hot in here. We'll shed our exoskeletons because they go through 23 stages of metamorphosis before they become sexually mature, right? Um, so it needs a little bit of light. So um, to quantify some of that light, um, if you guys go outside in about four hours, um, you're going to be exposed to uh, roughly 2,000 micromole photons per hey, meter squared Matt, second. Matt, yeah. you have a question. You have a question. Did go ahead. Did you ask your bag the, the fish, the brine shrimp to your algae culture? Like we add that bag or no? You can, you can add it to it right now. I'm going to go over adding it in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to finish the light stuff first, but you can go ahead and add those um, if you're curious about that and you just want to do it because um, it's fun. Um, but we're going to add everything into it right now. Yeah. Um, so, but outside at noon today, it's going to be about 2000 micromole Einsteins for, or, and I, if you're Einstein, you get light named after you apparently, right? So uh, um, an Einstein is a mole of photons. So micro Einsteins or micro mole photons per meter squared second. That's a flux of light that's coming in in the summertime here in California. It's about 2200 or so. Um, so, but this algae, Nanochloropsis, it saturates at 120 micro mole Einsteins per meter squared second. So um, that's a lot less. It's about 5% of the light outside. So this means that this is very much an indoor plant. We don't want direct sunlight on this in this in this context in these beaker bags. So uh, the artificial light is great. If you want to be uh, super awesome and support us and buy one of our fancy um, uh, uh, bench top lights, these are great because you can set a whole bunch of beaker bags on them and they look really really cool. So when your administrators come in to um, see your classroom, you can show them how cool it looks. Um, but it, the algae then will start to grow. Um, you have it on a timer so that you can have a light dark cycle of about 12 hours on and 12 hours off. Um, so that way uh, they can go and experience the light dark cycles inside of photosynthesis. Um, and then the algae is going to start to grow. Um, and this is where we get to have a little bit of fun and your students can start their data set right after this. So what you're going to see is um, a two days or so where you're not going to see much algae growth. And that's the lag phase. So this is uh, either me walking like an Egyptian or it's an X, Y plot. So two days, and this is time and days, about two days where you don't see much growth and then it's gonna grow exponentially really fast. So you'll see um, the algae growing so fast. So when we start to measure it um, and you'll be able to measure it uh, using our tool that you have in your bag there too. Um, you'll be able to measure it at like 8, 11 and 2 PM and actually be able to see quantification in a single day of the algae growing. It grows that fast, um, but then it'll reach stationary phase and finally decline. But you're asking yourself, okay, Matt, what is this tool that you speak of to measure things? And for those of you who have ever taken an oceanography class or luminology, have you guys ever seen a target that looks like that? Yeah, maybe. This is a Secchi stick that we derived from a Secchi disc. So apparently there was this fella from the 1700s named Secchi he was a buddy of the Pope's, a Pope, I guess. Uh, he took the Pope's boat out all the time and with his wife, apparently. And uh, he was an astronomer. So he was looking at light attenuation, but he, make, he took the Pope's boat out. Um, I didn't make any of this up. And he put a dinner plate on a rope and he lowered it over the side of the boat until it disappeared. And he found that near shore, that plate disappeared in very shallow water. So he, he put it down and it only went so far before the plate disappeared. And then when he went out in the middle of, of the Mediterranean and he lowered it out there, it went really, really super deep. So he was like, ah, okay. He had just uh, inadvertently discovered optical density, right? It's the very same stuff using the very same principle um, as your spectrophotometer does, the Beer-Lambert law, which is the density or the, uh, the amount of dissolved or suspended substances within the liquid are directly proportional to the optical density. So what we're gonna be able to do now is use this tool 
um, and measure the algae concentration in the beaker bags. Um, so we'll demonstrate that real quick. And inadvertently, um, Seki met his demise because um, apparently he was out uh, taking some Seshi measurements and his wife had had enough of him for some reason or another. And he was bent over the side of his boat taking a Seshi measurement and she pushed him over and uh, he was never heard of again. So here we go. This is now the Seshi stick set target disappearing. We're gonna look now, instead of counting how deep the rope is, I'm gonna look right now at the, the Seshi stick depth and I have 30 millimeters of Seshi stick depth right there. Three zero, 30 millimeters. I'm gonna bring this right back up here. That is, um, it's an SI unit. Yes, Matt. Yes, it is an SI unit, but that's not, that's not biomass. You're right. Um, but uh, we can convert that Seshi stick depth to a real biomass measurement in dry weight, grams per liter. So all you gotta do is on the, uh, if you guys look on your instructions um, on the backside here, of them, these are the measurements of algae biomass um, using a Seshi stick. I just have all the instructions right there, but down at the bottom of right there, you've got that QR code. Um, that QR code will take you to um, our website and we just bury all of the technical information like this plot onto the product page. So it's at the bottom of that right there. Look for a plot that reads something like nanochloropsis, Seshi stick depth and dry weight in grams per liter as a function of cell count. Again, I'm a very visual person, so I can imagine cells being there really easily. Okay, so here we go. So we had 30 milliliters, milliliters, 30 millimeters of Seshi stick depth. I'm gonna go all the way over and drop down. So that's about 4 million cells per uh, a milliliter. Wow, that's a lot of cells, right? So I'm going to come back up from there. Uh, and this brings us to about 0.4 grams of biomass per liter, grams of dry weight biomass per liter. And if you're a, if you've ever taken your ecology classes, you know that when you're looking at biomass, wet biomass changes, right? Just as um, on a Sunday morning when you wake up after being out late with your friends, you know that your water concentration has definitely changed overnight with what your, your bar activities were the night before. You got to rehydrate we can't rely on mass with just water, right? As you just take a, I saw you drinking water just now. Yeah, um, um, so your, your water weight would change. So we need to use dry weight. That way we remove all the water from the system and just look at how much biomass you actually have there. That way that, that's why we use that dry weight biomass. So that's how we can determine that dry weight biomass. And so 0.4 grams per liter, this speaker bag is roughly a half a liter. So in here, we have 0.2 grams or 200 milligrams of biomass inside there. Put that number inside your head, 200 milligrams of biomass inside the beaker bag. Um, so now uh, we've got the algae growing. We can quantify it. Your students, you can imagine them coming in at the beginning of class during the transition. Okay, class. Um, yes, teacher will do exactly what you say instantly, right? But they go, they grab their Seshi stick, they take a measurement, they write it in their notebook, and now they've got a long-term data set, right? Really easy to do with an analytical instrument that if they drop it on the floor, it won't break. Um, really simple and cool. So that's how we get the algae data for biomass grams per liter. Any, any questions on it so far? Awesome, cool. Okay, great. So the next thing that we're gonna do is um, we are going to bring the party animals and every party animal arrives to the party with a baggie of white powder, right? Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on, depends on where you're partying, I guess. Um, in this case, this baggie of white powder is brine shrimp cysts and, um, and they're in a vehicle of sodium bicarbonate. Why do we put sodium bicarbonate in there? Because brine shrimp cysts weigh like very, very little. And for us to actually try to get you about 300 to 600 brine shrimp cysts per beaker bag, uh, it would be very difficult for us to weigh it out. So we blend it in with sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, um, which happens to be a really great pH buffer. So we're going to be basically helping out the whole system by adding in some carbon buffer to it. 
So add that whole baggie um, of brine shrimp cysts to your water, to your algae culture, and give it a good shaky shake. Sometimes the, um, the salts, as you add them, they get stuck in, the, um, in the, uh, the, the Ziploc seal up there. The seals are good, but they're not perfect. So just as an FYI, um, uh, you can, don't store them laying down. I like to use the grid downside to take a photo of it if you wanna get the full picture, um, but uh, otherwise store them sitting upright. They'll stand up really well, um, but don't trust them on their sides. But you can see the brine shrimp eggs inside there right now. So what's gonna happen is in like one to three days, the brine shrimp will emerge. They will be Nauplius larva with one single Nauplius eye on the top of their head, um, just like plankton from SpongeBob. Um, and that's a cool thing too, because those Nauplius larva, which I've got some right here, I'll show you. Those Nauplius larva are now phototaxic. They're going to try to go up to the light to go to where the algae is to graze on it. And this one is from Dolora Maori. This is about a week ago, um, a little more than a week ago now. And you can see the Nauplius larva in there and they are just swimming around. These guys have might have, might have already gone through a couple of phases of metamorphosis. Can you see the, uh, the brine shrimp in there? Had to focus, huh? Maybe back a little bit further. Yeah, you can see them swimming around in there. Um, how many of them do you see in there? Can you count them for me? Trick question. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at them here and I'm seeing probably several hundred of them. So just as an aside, you're gonna start with between 300 to 600, but with the mature culture, uh, it's gonna get to be between eight to 20 adults, right? That's what you're gonna be left with, about eight to 20 adults. So just put that one in your head too. So what we're gonna do, this next part that we're quantifying now is you're gonna challenge your students to see how many brine shrimp larvae are actually in the beaker bag. And to do this, you're going to um, have them come up with the entire protocol themselves. The ones that are super smart will actually look on the back. And this is the middle, middle set of instructions here, how to estimate the, the population of, of, of larva. Um, but basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with a protocol on how to count them, right? and let your students come up with this. They're totally smart enough to do it. There's too many to count here because they're moving around and stuff. And sometimes it's difficult to snap a photograph of it and count the individuals. So you're gonna take a sample of them. These are volumetric um, uh, pipetters here and they're, they're really good, they're pretty accurate. So the smallest number here is a half a milliliter, right? So you are going to specific, you're going to deceive your students and you're going to have them take a sample that's deliberately too small so that they make a mistake and they have to figure out what happens. So first thing you do when you have this ecosystem you're trying to estimate the population of is homogenate the ecosystem, right? Um, you can't do this with any old ecosystem. You need uh, to uh, have, um, <laughs> you need to have the ecosystem. You, you can't do this to like an arboreal ecosystem, right? because the people who care about deer will be upset if you're trying to count deer and you chop down all the trees. That would suck. Anyway, you could do it to this one though. So I pulled out a half a mil there and I'm looking at it and I am counting exactly zero brine shrimp. All right, this is a half a milliliter. This is roughly a half a liter. So I'm gonna multiply this by a thousand. How many ever I saw in here by a thousand? And that's gonna give me the count here. So zero times a thousand is zero. Is that correct? No. What do you mean it's not correct? I did it, right? I took a subsample. I put it back. Why isn't it right? Because you didn't get, you didn't sample enough. You need more water. What do you mean I need more water? You need to look at more. Well, how do I look at more? You need a larger sample. Oh, okay, cool. How big of a sample do I need? Find out. Design an experiment. There we go. So what you're going to find out, these go up to three mils. Your students should set up a table in like Excel or Google Sheets and have the total volume that they sample. So it, it'll go like three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, if they're counting them in threes, right? And then the cumulative amount of brine shrimp that they observe. And then the next column over will be doing the math and it's just a ratio to the total volume of the beaker bag that'll describe the estimated cumulative population estimate of this. 
And they'll find when they plot that out to sample size versus estimated population, the first ones will either be crazy high or zeros. And then they'll come and they'll become really normal. And they become normal in between 10 to 15 mils. So have them do it up to 50 and then have them decide for themselves how many they need to sample. Right? Pretty cool, huh? Right? Great way. They get to play with the experiment. They get to design the whole thing. And it's totally hands-on. All right. So that's counting the population. That's getting a population estimate for that brine shrimp. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to estimate the, the brine shrimp adult biomass. So here we go. These are the adults now. So what you want to do here, the first thing you'll do is um, this is now in the ecosystem. And that's what we're looking at. You've got to count the adults that are in here. Right now, um, I've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, about eighteen adult brine shrimp in here. And if there's a lot there, you can just take a photograph of it and then count them individually. Your students will thank you for letting them pull their phones out. Um, but once you do that, then what you're going to want to do is take the adults that are there, and you're going to find one of them. I like to do this with a sawed-off shotgun approach. No, um, I just, the, they're bigger and I like to be nice. So I'm gonna find an adult in there that's nice and big. There's a big old male. Come here, buddy. Come here. I gotcha. It's okay. See him in there? He's in the front. He's like, I wanna go home. So I grab that adult right there, that brine shirt, the male. And then I'm gonna take him. And this is a piece of equipment, lab equipment. It's a dewatering tool. Um, most labs have them, but they get to be kind of expensive. You could say there's a bounty of reasons that you'd have them around. Uh, yeah, that's what I was expecting. The sensible chuckle. Um, there you go. This is now dewatering the outside of the brine trap. All the water is going to get wicked away by this fine bounty. Um, so at this point now, there's no water outside of that brine trap. And we can take that and put it onto a pre-weighed aluminum piece of aluminum foil or a weigh boat, right? I like to use the aluminum foil uh, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, but I don't like to touch them. I always figure my hands are pretty clumsy. So I like to take something and here I'm gonna use the Aseshi stick. And I'm just gonna flick him onto this um, thing right there. You can see him on the, he's on the side. He's green because he's been eating algae. It's pretty healthy looking. So at this point you can weigh him on your analytical balance, okay? He's going to weigh about six milligrams, okay? An adult brine shrimp is going to weigh about six milligrams. Um, but uh, uh, that's wet weight. To get, and, and if you want to, to actually get a good mass of them, because you're, depending on how awesome your analytical balance is, who has a great analytical balance in their classroom? Probably not everybody. You might need to weigh five to 10 of them to actually get a good mass of your brine shrimp depending on the analytical balance. So um, you, get, you get them and you weigh them, and then that's the wet weight. But if you really wanna be good scientists, you need to get to the dry weight. So meditate back on the, um, that concert you went to at Bon Jovi, and you're just gonna take a lighter and you're gonna roast these guys under the lighter. It'll take about 30 seconds and you'll drive off all the water from the brine trip. And that's gonna get you to your dry weight. And that dry weight is the number you want to compare back to the algae biomass in, yes, dry weight. Between you and me, the biomass of an adult brine shrimp is just over one milligram. So it's 1.1 milligrams. So if I have, I'm gonna put this guy back. They're okay to be out for about 20 minutes. So, and, uh, so if you don't want to dry them out, right, um, you can simply divide the mass of the wet weight brine shrimp, just divide it by five, and that's going to get you the dry weight. Masa menos, it'll get you close enough. So that's a great way to do that. So let's look at this really quick now. So I had 18 brine shrimp in there uh, as adults, and each one of them weighs about a, um, uh, a milligram, just a little over a milligram. So we'll call it about 20 milligrams of brine shrimp biomass. And in this really thick, very dense algae culture that we looked at earlier, I had uh, 200 milligrams, right? So I have 200 milligrams of algae biomass 
and 20 milligrams of brine shrimp biomass. That's about a 10 to one ratio, which is what we see when we do trophic level exchanges going from primary producer to grazer, to grazer in an idealized situation, right? So this works really, really super well to be able to get those things going. So we love this kit. We think it's really easy to use um, and the math on it is really fun to do as well. Um, and from here, now you can manipulate everything, right? Um, you can add more of the nutrients and make a eutrophic condition inside the community. You can change the salt concentration. Higher salt will kill the algae, but the brine shrimp will be happier, but they'll starve because then there's not enough food for them. Um, you could change light conditions. You could do toxicology with it. Oh, oh my God, Kelsey, this is a new one that we just were playing with. Um, for all you ladies and guys like me who like to go get pedicures, do you guys know what this stuff is? It's acrylic nail fill, right? And I bought a pack of this that is um, fluorescent, right? So it glows under a black light. So I went ahead and took this acrylic powder, which is about a half a micron in diameter. Um, and brine shrimp will eat anything that they can fit in their mouths. So this acrylic powder uh, is basically a thing that's small that they can fit in their mouths. And it's also a microplastic by definition. So I put that in with these brine shrimp right here and um, you're, it's gonna be hard to see, but I was able to demonstrate microplastic grazing by these primary produce. Can you see anything red in there? It's kind of hard to see it, but um, the, uh, the poop, if you will, if you'll forgive me, maybe I'm obsessed with the poop. Can you see those guys right there? Can you see any red in there? I should do it with, with like a blue maybe. I've got a whole set of them. Um, but they, uh, I, I, took, I, took all, I took the whole team into the bathroom and we shut off the light and turned on the little, the little black light. You can see their gastrointestinal system is just pink because they were eating the microplastic. So this is a great toxicology experiment as well, a demonstration. So all this stuff is really, really cool to be able to use. Um, if you guys got any questions, uh, let's go ahead and shout them out. And while you're doing that, I'll answer them. And then we'll break down the uh, algae bead experiment we did because we're going to circle back to that. Um, I do a lot of stuff with uh, water uh, quality stuff. And I have a dissolved test kit in my room that I purchased. Um, you have a dissolved what tested? Dissolved oxygen test kit. Oh, you do? Oh, do you have a DO probe as well? No, it's not a probe. It's an actual chemical test where you add a couple of reagents and then get some sodium dioxide sulfate to add in and do drops. So, like, you think it would change noticeably over the course of, like... Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Absolutely. So we love those. Uh, anything where you can measure oxygen I, is dynamite in my book. One of the things that we do is we take a, oh no, I took it all away. Um, we take, um, and I'm gonna grab one from here. Give me one second. I like to take centrifuge tubes in a little rack like this, fill them all up with algae. And then um, if you put the brine shrimp in, uh, this is the same thing you're talking about oxygen. Uh, with algae, equal amounts of algae, and then zero, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32 brine shrimp, cap it, put it in the light. What you'll see is the zero, one, and two brine shrimp are gonna have oxygen bubbles on the outside, just like the, all those Elodia leaf experiment stuff, right? Um, and those are gonna be, the brine shrimp inside there will be swimming around super happy, right? Um, that's because the oxygen bubbles, because it's super saturated with O2. Um, and then the middle one with the four brine shrimp, Will the, everyone will be swimming around happy, uh, but they won't have the oxygen bubbles. And the ones over here, the eight, 16, and 32, they're going to be swimming around, but they're going to be swimming around very, very, very slowly. And you could take your, and the reason that they're doing that is that there's more demand for oxygen over here. This is after about four hours of being in these tubes. So they are, they're just getting really, really kind of like, uh, Fellas, is there something wrong? Um, so they're suffocating, they're going anoxic, right? Um, but that's a great thing. So you can demonstrate it by looking at the brine shrimp behavior, and then you can prove it by using your analytical test kit for color to, to do the color metric test for O2, which is really awesome. Okay. Cool. So I've got uh, these here now. 
this is the cold and the room temperature. Can you guys see a difference in the color there? Yeah. I, I certainly can, yeah. So here it is. I say that these are still down in the, the orangey range back at what, a, just over seven, eight-ish right there. And then these are definitely a further along in that. So I would say, yeah, this kind of supports the, uh, the theory that um, we're talking about uh, an enzyme here. Ah, but look at the one that was in the 50s. Wah, wah. That went backwards. That went all the way back down. So those are dead. They are no more. So if you're going to get a big mess of algae beads, you want to make sure that you, and you do this experiment with them and you kill a couple, make sure that these are taken out. I just threw them in the bin. You didn't see that. They're taken out of the population because they won't work a second time because they're dead. Finally, we've got the light and dark. So here are the light. As we expected, they look similar to the ones at room temperature. And in the aluminum foil, I have two that are very, very light in the dark. So yes, and this is consistent here as well. So these yeah. were in the dark and these are more yellow than these are here. These are turning a little bit orangey. Um, and then these four here are about the same. Pretty cool. I think we definitely see a light dependent uh, um, process with the algae beads. Um, and we see a temperature dependent stuff too. So there's a good chance that, or at least this stuff supports the theory that enzymes and photosynth that photosynthesis is an enzyme driven um, light dependent process. Awesome. Hey, well, I'm here for you guys. If you need anything, I'm just downstate. Um, so happy to help out with whatever I can. We really want you guys to be able to see I can grow algae and your students as well, because worst case scenario, better, more educated voters. Best case scenario, Dude, they saved the world, and that's a big deal. Hey, uh, okay. Matt. Hey, Matt. Real quick, um, uh, they had a question. You know, in your algae bead tubes, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what's in there? That's just an indicator, right? Oh, yeah. It's called a carbonate indicator. Um, you can pull down the instructions to make them all over the internet. It's bromothiol blue, creosol red. Uh, you dissolve that in an alcohol. Um, I think we use isopropyl, and then. Um, you, from there, you put it into a gallon of water with some uh, buffer. I think it's just sodium bicarbonate again. And then just keep that diluted. And that's a concentrated solution. So you can make it down from there. Or you can just buy it from us because we already do it. Are all of your prices and everything that you have available on your website? Yeah, everything's on the website. And um, Danielle probably keyed in. You probably don't know yet. But there's going to be a discount code for you guys. Um, it's APSI 33%. It'll get you a third off of our stuff. Um, and uh, so, yeah, go ahead and use that if you want to. If you don't want to, pay full price. It'd be great. Um, but, uh, and if it's still too expensive, let us know how we can help out. Um, we want your business. We want you guys to be able to grow the stuff. We're, um, we're pretty passionate about it also. Nice. Uh, one more question for you. Yeah. Oh, I've got all day. Go ahead. Is this too keep put together as one just for us or it's sold like that? We have, we put it together just for you guys. We call this one the, the Brainy Briny Beaker Bag Plus Two. So it just has a couple algae beads in it to goof around with. Um, but so we do have it on the website, um, but generally it's really the, 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 the Plus Two is the best thing for using, um, the, this is best, the best thing for using for a demonstration for teachers. Um, and we put it on there because it's a great skew to give to you guys. But you can do this just an A-B test with your students because those two, uh, uh, um, the, two uh, 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 the two algae beads that you have in your bag have very similar light histories. So they should be the same color. So you can put one in the dark and one in the light and get a couple experiments with done with it. And they live for one to four months. So you can use them again and again and again. And again. An email. I actually have a question regarding a project that I do regarding an ecosystem. Do you have an email that I yeah. can email that I I have some yeah I need some slides on and can I email? Oh. Yeah, um, and it should be on our stuff here, but it's service at algaeresearchsupply dot com. Yeah, I I see your email, but I just don't see the actual email. So okay, it? so yeah, just service at algaeresearchsupply dot com. Oh, look, it's funny that it's not on there. Is it on our algae beads? Uh, no, we didn't put an email on there. Oh, well. Um, so it's service oh. at algaeresearchsupply.com. Awesome. 
Yeah, I just need some advice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, happy to help out. All right, anything else? All right. Hey, uh, you guys take a uh, quick break here and then we'll run into lunch. Hey, Matt, I was going yeah. to, uh, here we go. Um, you, uh, you need to buy these that stand. I, that stand. I have them. That's what we, that's, that's our general one is the self-standing ones. These ones yeah. in here. Um, I like these cause they all stay together, but, oh, um, we, we found a set of these with a the cone bottom because we bought a centrifuge for 50 oh, mils. Man. And we can't use them with the self-standing. So we have the cone bottom ones. So this is where they live when I'm not using those. And it's convenient. Yeah. Well, exactly. So, um, well, hey, oh, there's a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah. How long do they last for? Like, is the sister in there, the zombie stuff, like, will it be good forever on the shelf or whatever before I actually use it? Pretty much. So um, if you set it up, right when you set it up is like um is a fun time to measure the to do like predator prey dynamics because your prey is the the algae and the predator is the brine shrimp but they'll live for years um but you'll get that predator prey dynamic within the first six weeks when i'm setting it up like if we just buy them and i have extras because i have a pretty small class like oh okay if you have extras believe it or not the the algae that's in those tubes it is it's an absolute dynamo so you can leave it in the tube for months at a time um, and it'll be fine just sitting there. As long as it's green, shake it up and it's going to look absolutely beautiful. We've kept nanochloropsis in little bags, little Ziploc bags um, or actually poly bag um, for like four years in dim light. They need to just stay room temperature in dim light and they just, they don't want to die. They like to live. They, they're like, okay, we're fine. Pull us out when you need us. And the cysts, the same thing, they class. Yeah, the cysts are, believe it or not, the cysts could be a little bit more temperamental depending on where they are. They're good for probably a year. Um, but just hit us up. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you want some, if, you're, if you have to put a PO in and get an official PO, um, reach out to us and let us know. Say, hey, deliver half now and half later. We'll work with you guys. I mean, I'm, we've all taught. Uh, I, I have eight years under my belt in community colleges. So I, I get, you know, everything that you guys have to go through and the weird stuff just to make it meet your semester schedule. We want to help you guys out. I'm on your team. Thank you. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. I will uh, see you next week. Next week. All right, Mr. Kelsey. Be good. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Later. Bye.